have a touch the pad. Yeah. In the world, fused. Now then crew and welcome back to the Andy Mechanic YouTube channel and I did shave the other day look at that, I got rid of all that big grizzly bear stuff going on um, it's time to get Tall Girl Lily's farm bike sorted and uh, if you remember before we made a list, did a video of all the problems we found, I've found a few more since then so the list is getting longer unfortunately and of course time is running out, this has got to be done before Christmas. I'd like to do a Christmas special of a riding around the paddock for the first time on it. Let's wait and see, won't we? Fingers crossed. Now, I did have a rummage around the paddock and I found a similar bike for donor parts. So I think the first thing for us to do is to make that cardboard list of what we need to do to this bike. Here we go. Okay, first job is it needed a new battery basically it was missing so we must also check the charging as well so we'll do that um, now we found broken spokes in the rear wheel so I've got a spare rear wheel that we can borrow some more we can steal some spokes out of And the rear tire is bald, so it needs a rear tire on it. Uh, chain and sprockets are completely shot, so it needs those. It needs uh, front brake pads, they were pretty, pretty low. It also needs uh, this, some parts missing from the rear brake, the drum brake at the back, so the pull rod is missing, I believe, memory, and the actual arm that goes onto the cam for the drum brake is, is badly bent. Now, I also, oh, we also spotted that the ignition barrel, well, the ignition basically stays on all the time. So we need to hopefully find a good ignition barrel off that other bike. I haven't tested it yet, so we'll have a look. Um, also, whilst pushing the bike around, I noticed that the steering head bearings are shot. Sorry, camera. And I think, at the moment, oh, there's no tail light and stuff, but we're not sure what we're going to do with that. And rear, rear indicators. Oh, nearly ran out of cardboard, look at that. And it needs a service. So, oil, filter, that kind of stuff. And a bit of love is what it needs. Okay, well, I think the first job is. Let's go and fill a battery. In fact, let's have a look at the parts I've already got for it. Now, it wouldn't be Sunday without a cider, so we'll crack that open now because, in all honesty, it's red hot down here. In fact, I'm going to put the fan on. Tell me if that really, really annoys you in the video. It might give it a bit of background noise. If it does, tell me, and then I'll stop using it. Uh, in the future, we're going to get aircon in the garage. How cool is that? Oh. I didn't choose this one. It's not bad though. Orchard Thieves Berry Cider. Okay, so I went shopping, ordered some parts from uh, Derby Accessories. Hi Ian, big shout out for them. They're up in Auckland, they've also got it's a uh, distribution centre in Christchurch. You'll find them online, Derby Accessories Auckland. Great guys. Now, uh, what do we need? Well, front brake pads, got those, hopefully they're the right ones. There's the part number, it's a Vesra part. So they're a good quality part. There you go, look. That definitely fits this bike, I'm sure. Uh, what else? Oh, a spark plug. Look at this. Look at that for wrapping. It's fantastic, isn't it? They know that if you drop a spark plug 
Oh, hang on. I need my knife. If you drop a spark plug, it damages it. So they wrap it up properly, look. And I was picking this stuff up. Maybe they know what my driving's like. Okay, so we've got a spark plug, which is a DR8EA. Now, I might already have those in stock, but I, I didn't know what it was, so I just ordered one. And they always do me a really good price. Uh, oil filter. We have here a HF132 high flow. Yes, I could have bought a Suzuki one, but I just wanted to get everything from one place. They're not that bad, surely. Um, what else have we got? Well, we've got a chain and sprockets. Now, remember, this is a farm bike, so it's got um, a much larger sprocket on the rear to standard. I'll have a look at that in a second. But we've gone, what did he send me down? Oh, an O-ring, look at that. DID, because I like DID chains. And it's an O-ring there, look, made in Japan. Just like the bike, these bikes are built in Japan. And it's a 520V. VO, whatever that means. No idea, never seen these before. And it will work on a bike of, look at that, you see, 125cc right up to 750. Mm. This is a 200, so. Anyway, and it's 120 links there, look. 120 links long, so fingers crossed. That's going to be long enough because we do have that much larger rear sprocket. And of course, when you've got a larger rear sprocket, you need a longer chain, so hopefully we've got it right. Now, I'm fitting a, a 48 tooth by the looks of it, rear sprocket, which is that one there, look. And the part number, and you get a free sticker, JT Sprockets. It's good stuff, actually. I've used that for years. And of course, we've got the front sprocket, which is that one there, which we've gone for a 15 tooth. Remember, this bike spends its time off road, and you want to be able to use all the gears, so you may as well gear it down. Better for the big steep hills, isn't it? Okay, what else have we got? Ah, ooh, here we go. Look, just before we do the last part, there is the Derby card. I picked that up when I was there and chucked it in the box, look. So hopefully you can see that. Very helpful chaps, and I'm sure that they'll ship probably anywhere in the world if you pay them enough money. So there you go. Bloody good. Right. Now, the uh, the steering head bearings, Derby's didn't do a listing for, I don't think. Or maybe they did. I, maybe I didn't know I needed them at the time. I can't remember. No, I did ask. They'd have to order them in. So um, I picked these up on my travels because there was some on a shelf from a very friendly um, motorcycle shop up in Kaitaia and they're all balls which again they're, they're not bad you know they're not as good as uh, genuine I wouldn't say but anyway there's the part number there look and white power sports they came from so cheers whites bit of a mixture today isn't it there yeah, look there's some more part numbers there so it's a 22-1004 and an ACR 30-07A perfect can't read backwards Okay, well, the parts box is empty. Uh, oh, I did get a battery as well. This came from Darby's. There's the battery. I bought a UAS, which is good quality. Now, I did spot, bear with me, I did spot this in the donor bike, a Power Road. Now, I do have a few bikes with these in. They're obviously, a, you know, not as good a quality as a UAS, um, but if you're on a budget, they're not bad. Um, now what else is a try? Oh yeah, the motor bats, the yellow batteries, the motor bats. I've had some very hit and miss experience with those, so good luck. We've got one in an SR125. I've had the same battery in for the last four or five years. And since its initial charge, the bike doesn't get used on the road. It's, it's actually deregistered now, unfortunately. My fault. It still has enough juice in it every year to start the bike. It's, it's an unbelievably good battery. But there are other motorbats out there which are just atrocious. I've had some really bad experience with some of them. But uh, your call, you've got to work it out. So we've got here, to put this on charge on the 30th of November. So it's been sat for about a week, fully charged. This is the new battery, obviously. So we'll go and stick that in first, get the bike fired up again. And then we're going to need to work on that ignition barrel first because I don't want the battery to go flat, obviously. Okay, one more slurp of cider. Here we go. Now these things are a real pain in the ass on these on these particular bikes because the the negative terminal is down here, and of course it's got to go in. So you can't actually put the negative wire on before you slide the battery. You've got to slide that through and try and line it all up. So it's a bit of a pain in the ass. So I may not do all of it to camera. We will see. Right, it's got a new little bag of bits. and get into it. Jeez, cut my nails the other day.
Mechanics never have long nails anyway, do we? Every screwdriver. Ha! That'll do. Right. Oakley, Oakley. So we just don't need half of them for now. We're going to pull that out and I'm going to put the terminals in the horizontal position, I think, the wires. So we're going to slide that out, slide that in there. Hopefully it's in the right place. Yes, there we go. Back in there. Oh my god. That ain't going to work. This one is going to have to go with the screw on this side. I just don't have any access. So I'll hop that out of there. We'll turn it round. And we'll gingerly put it back in there. There you are, look. Got the Eric quote for the day. Slot that back in there. And then we're going to move the camera and see if we can get that wire on. Holy moly, this is almost impossible to get in. Sorry, camera. Right, so we'll do up the screw like that, haven't we? Bloody hell. Who was thinking that was a good idea? There isn't a cat to the airbox out, that's just too much of a palaver. The battery should be really easy and quick to fit and install and everything, but on this bike, definitely not. And you're supposed to fit the ground last. God, doesn't really help, does it? So that has got to go on there. Let's just get a bit more of a bend. Man, it's not easy. Who thought this was a good idea? Long nose pliers, here we go. My fingers will never fit in there. Oh, don't do that. A bit more grip required. Oh, we're in. <laughs> the camera's in the way. Swap hands. Sorry, camera. We're going to start taking pictures now of the camera because I keep touching the thingy. Oh, come on. Right, you can watch me struggle from a distance. I've put the, put the, basically the screw in, as you saw, but the angle to get the screw started, if you're not careful, it's going to cross thread. I think it already has. So I'm going to tilt the battery a bit and get a little angle. Ah, there we go. Get that. Right, that's the ground of the earth in. Now for the positive. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Positive. Now, this one's going to go in from the top, I think, be easier. I'll just pull the battery back out a little bit so we're not going to short the screwdriver out on the frame. Because we're doing this the wrong way around. You should always fit the positive first, and then the earth. Way, see, ignition's on. Right, left handed screwdriver job. Look at that. There we go, nice and tight. Put a little cap on, don't want things shorting out. <laughs> it's not very well fitting, is it, to be honest? Okay, I'll slide that in. It's miles away from the steel, so we're all good. Ooh, we have a little band somewhere, hang on. Might as well stick that back on, stop it flying around. Well, we're going to be disconnecting the ignition shortly anyway, so... All the way around, Mr. Young. There we go. So she's not going to flatten off on us. <coughs> right. Done. Will it start? Let's find out. Okay, fuel is on prime, which is just fine. Bit of choke. Ignition's already on. Should start. Right. Not sure which way around that is. We'll give it a try. 
out, out. You ready? Here we go. Oh no, I remember that. It was clutch, wasn't it? Here we go. reliable that's been packed up for the whole week started straight up well as battery installments go that wasn't the easiest in the world but hey it's only a battery it's in now next job because unfortunately if you can see or not the headlight on the bike is on burning away quite happily and flattening that battery see the, the light on the cover on the, the racking there look that light is obviously draining that battery pretty quick it's a new battery and so the end of the world, because when we put when we you know test the charging circuit, it's always good to have a battery that needs a bit of charge putting in, so we should get a decent output from the stator. Okay, let's go and dig our way in and disconnect that ignition barrel just to stop the battery from flattening. And then we'll go and check out the donor bike and pull the ignition barrel off that and see if they're gonna if, it, if it's interchangeable. And then that way we fix the problem easily. With you know, trying to pull an old ignition barrel apart and work out what the problem is is just too hard. And I don't have time for it. Let's take a look. Right, let's get this headlight surround off. At least then we can unplug the headlight as well quickly to stop that uh, draining the battery down. Oh, that was pretty easy, wasn't it? Okay, Mr. Headlights, what do we need to do now? Well, I'm just about reach in and unplug that, um, that light, that uh, connector at the back. Jeez, that's tight. Okay, where's the ignition? There he is. Get the ignition. It looks like it. Let's try that. Ha! Perfect. Okay, all the dash lights are out. So the ignition is only a two wire. Look at that. So all it's doing is connecting those two together. If I get the screwdriver, we'll just bridge that across again. There you go, look. Ignition on, ignition off. On, off. Hey, I shouldn't say this because obviously if you wanted to borrow one of these motorcycles, all you'd need to do is take the cowl off and connect the orange to the red wire so please forget that i've mentioned that in this video because that could get me into lots of trouble okay ignition barrel needs to come off now and the bolts now they usually use anti-theft bolts on these things which is a bit of a problem so i wonder if we can just swap the switch gear out the actual switch part of the mechanism and that is normal screws and then that way we get to keep the same key because that'd be good for the fuel tank there's a plan right so let's whip the headlight off for now that's just these four ha, three and a half bolts that one's already loose look okay oh man and this one the hell somebody's been in here and it wasn't me oh no all of them were loose didn't even need a spanner that is fantastic There we go. Right. So we can hopefully unplug that now. There we go. Get rid of the headlights, and now we've got a bit of room to work. So, oh, look at that. Okay, that's not so good. We'll take a look at that on the bench. That might be the problem. You need to look at this. Look what I spotted. There's been a rub through. And you can see here, look, it's all brown. It might be. I don't know. I thought those wires were touching together. Let's just try it again and see if the ignition comes on now that there's been separated. It does. Okay, so there is definitely an internal fault. Yeah, ignition's definitely turned off. Yeah. So we definitely have a fault with the ignition with the barrel itself with the switch gear so we're going to see if we can extract the switch gear with the ignition barrel in place because it's got those what am I going to show you oh, that's it 
Are they Allen bolts? Let's take a look. Let's have a little look, see if we can get the old camera in there. What we're looking at, Mr. Pointy Screwdriver, that there is one of the retaining bolts, and it looks like an Allen head, a cap head. Oh, no, it's round. It is round. It is a, a safety security bolt thing. Okay, instead we're going to remove that screw. And there is another one. Get out of the way, wire. That screw there. And take this switch gear off the bottom of the ignition barrel. And hopefully, on the donor bike over there, it'll be the same. Right, let's see if we can get in. I might need a dumpy screwdriver for that, actually. Okay, here we go. Sorry to get the camera any closer, unfortunately, but we're going to make sure that the ignition is turned off. I think it's that position there, I'll look at it. Okay. Now, I'm not too sure how successful this will be, but we've got nothing to lose. Right, there's one screw. Also quite bizarre that it's uh, the wiring has actually been shorting out onto the bike's frame as well. Which could be another reason why it was scrapped. It does look like somebody has been in here. There was a missing bolt from here as well, holding the headlight shroud on. So maybe we'll take a little look and go, oh, it's going to need a new ignition barrel. It's just not worth fixing, which is ridiculous, obviously. And down comes the rain, so apologies. So in there is the actual switch gear, and this is a separate component to the actual uh, ignition barrel itself. So if the other bike, the donor bike, has got the same piece on it, and it's working correctly, then we can just do a straight swap and keep the original ignition key, which will fit the fuel tank cap as well, which is a real bonus, plus any other locks that are on the bike. I'm trying to keep this repair to a bare minimum. And you can see there, look, that the the wiring is quite badly burnt and it is actually, it's almost like it's being cut. If you look there, look, there's two, two nicks that are identical. It's been rubbing on something and that's been causing it to, you know, to burn. Bugger. Okay, maybe we'll have a little look at this later on the bench if we have time, if we've got enough uh, recording time left on the phone. In the meantime, let's whip over to the donor bike and get this off it. Here we go. Now it is just genuinely uh, sat on this modified ax, um, ax jack basically that uh, I made years ago before I bought a hoist. Oh, another bolt, hang on. Screwdriver required. Jeez! Holy moly, that's tight. Some gorillas tightened that up. God. Nah, it's not going to fall off. <sighs> right. Okay, so, oh look, same plug. Perfect. So we need that. I'm plugging off there. It's a bit rusty, but. A bit corroded, but we'll cope. Get rid of that uh, little reusable clip. We can reuse that on something. And just getting that out. I'm just going to snip that out of the way because we're annoying. Remember, these bikes are scraps, it's all good. Use the scrap jeeps. Is a lot worse than that. Okay. Little screwdriver again. Make sure we're in the. Ah, okay, so that's the on position there. So we were in the off position. That's good. And. I'm going to whip that out of there. Now, I don't know if this, this one's any good or not. I suppose we could test it, couldn't we? Let's do that. Let's do a test first. Just to be sure. Right, we've got a battery rigged up with the test light. I've had to rear probe with the clips. It's not best uh, best connection at all, but it'll work for this. Just quick and quick and dirty on there. Hopefully, you should be able to see the bulb on there. Turn the ignition on. 
Oh yes, look at that, it's one that actually turns on and off. Fantastic, so we know it works, which is good. Let's get rid of our wires. Brilliant, see a little test light, dead easy isn't it? Obviously we don't know if it can carry the current, but uh, it's good to go I think. Right, so now we can remove this in confidence, so we know it works. Which is pretty cool. Oh, it's alright, we've got a spare one. Oh, bike number nine. Huh. Pretty good. I was very fortunate to come across quite a few of these bikes. Most of them are Hondas, these farm bikes, but uh, no spiders. Right, let's go and stick that on the other bike. Hopefully, it's going to work. Should do. How was that for a shot? Look at that. So you can see the mechanical part of the ignition barrel. If I turn the key, basically what it does. And it is working, which is good to know. So we'll make sure it's in the off position, which is that. Which is the same position we took this one off in. And then it should fit up like that. He says... Look at that. Okay, right, let's stick a screw in there. So obviously it's important that you you know have it in the same position on both barrels, otherwise you're gonna be struggling to line everything up. Right, that's one. It seems to be quite sitting there we go. Screw number two going in. Pretty simple, isn't it, really? Hopefully, Lily's going to like her new bike. That's the plan. Should work very well. Oh no, what was that? It was just clicking into place, fortunately. Right. Right, so this zips out all the, all the other wires out of the way so you can see what's going on. I'll plug that in there. I'll put some anti corrosion spray in there, some terminal spray uh, later on. But just for now, we'll just test it. So that's plugged in. Uh, ignition is off. Press the horn. Nothing works. Ignition on. Beautiful horn. Fantastic. Right, well, the ignition works. We fixed it. Brilliant. Oh, that's not so good, is it? Cool, we'll find another bolt for down the bottom, and we won't tighten it up as tight as on the other bike either. Right, final check, ignition on, bike should start. Oh, got to pull the clutch in. Hang on a minute. What a machine! So that was pretty cool, managed to get it fixed with zero cost. Ivan will like that. Okay, I did use another ignition barrel, but it didn't cost me anything basically, it was a scrap bike. So I'll probably do a separate video on pulling this apart and we'll take a look and see why it's failed. And you know, not the reason why it's all burnt, but I wanna know what's going on inside there. I reckon I can get it apart. It's got little tabs on either side, so I can push those in and probably be some springs and ball bearings and stuff and fly out but we'll go in, we've got nothing to lose and we'll see if we can work out why it's permanently um, closed circuit rather than a switch which should go open circuit and then closed circuit depending on the key position 
<sighs> right, what's next? Well, let's tick some things off the list. Let's get rid of those. Okay, so we've done the battery, but we haven't yet done the charging rate. So maybe we should do that next. So we'll check the charging rate, then we can forget all about the electrical system for now. Uh, rear spokes, rear tyre chain and sprockets, well they're all sort of linked together aren't they really? They're all the same job, front pads is a separate job. Um, again we can do that at the same time as doing the back end, because that's the, the rear brake parts. Ignition on all the time, we've fixed that, done. Done the battery. Steering head bearings, well we'll do those at the same time as the front pads, so that's sort of linked together down there look. Let's do those two jobs together. Tail light, well, that's just, it might happen, it might not, we don't know. Uh, the other bikes don't have the same back end, so I don't have any parts, that's the problem, so it may well not have a tail light. It would be nice to get the indicators and stuff working, but it's just not going to happen, I don't think. And the service, well, that's separate again, so, well, what should we do? Should we do the back end or the front end? Let's do the back end, it's more fun. Right, quick charging check first. Let's just put that onto volts. There we go. I don't know if you can see that or not. Hopefully you can. Let's get this, thing, this beast fired up. good is it um, what we saw on the multimeter is before the engine was started around about 13 just over 13 volts a fully charged battery uh, that was with the headlight on which was pretty good actually pretty impressive or well, maybe it wasn't I can't remember now but turn the ignition on and started the bike and the uh, the higher I rev the bike the lower the voltage went because don't forget the ignition systems having to produce more sparks because the engines running faster and if it's not charging, that's going to pull the voltage of the battery down. These are only tiny little batteries, they're not like car batteries. So you can, you can see these kind of differences pretty obviously. So there's definitely no charging going on. Set point voltage is about 14.5. We should have seen that climb to 13.9, 14. And as the battery fully charges up to 14.5, especially if we disconnected the headlight bulb. Because on this bike, you can't turn the headlight off. It's on as soon as the ignition's on. And that's a halogen bulb, so you've got to take that into account as well. But you may never actually see the 14.5 until you've unplugged the headlight. So, we either have a faulty regular, uh, reg rectifier unit, which is the regulator stroke rectifier unit all in one housing on motorcycles, or we've got a burnt out stator. Now, hopefully, it's the reg rectifier unit and not the stator. If it's a stator, I've got to take the, you know, a, a, the, the flywheel cover off, replace the stator. It's, it's a much bigger job than just changing the reg rectifier unit. So I wonder if the reg rectifier unit is the same on the other bike. Let's take a look. Right, there are plenty of other videos on my channel covering testing charging systems. So we're just going to go straight in there and do a straight swap, hopefully. And see if it starts working. We are assuming, of course, that this one works. I do have one more bike outside for parts, so maybe, just maybe, that one, if this one doesn't work, will work. Okay, so we've got that plug there. Man, these connections are, oh, look at the green crusties in there. Nice, that's because it's permanent live. Okay, so that's that one done. And we've now got the stator field windings, there'll be three wires. Jeez. Oh, okay. 
So that is the regulator rectifier unit. We've got three wires, one from each of the uh, stator windings. We've got, which will be ground, the black with the white tracer, and we've got the red, which is battery positive. Because it needs to be able to sense battery voltage to know how much to charge the battery. Okay, let's go and see if it's the same on the other bike. It looks similar. Two bolt holes should be the same. This might be an aftermarket one. They may have already changed it, or that might be an aftermarket one. We just don't know, to be honest. Sort of working in the dark at the moment. Right, two bolts. And some white. Oh, that looks a very different plug, doesn't it? Shit. Honestly, you try. You try to be smart. And constantly, the manufacturer outsmarts you. Look at that. So we've got a single plug with the same colour wires. I can always swap the swap the plug across. Whereas on the other on this uh, on the other bike, we have the two separate plugs. Let me go and check what's on the bike that's outside and see if we can find one with these plugs to plug. Sorry, with this plug to plug straight in because it'll save us a bit of time, and I haven't got a lot of time today. That looks the same really does, so we'll whip those bolts out. Do like having lots of spare bikes. Right, hopefully the plug's the same. Oh yep, big single plug, that's what we need. Right, and do the little holder for the wire. Brilliant, right, let's try that on the other bike. See if it starts charging. If it does, we've fixed it doesn't it's gonna be a stator I reckon we'll do some more testing obviously right said Fred and that was fortunate wasn't it nobody's saying that this one's good as well to be honest but it's worth a try isn't it it's unlikely that all that both bikes won't be charging they'll both the same fold fingers crossed Okay. And the other bike does look the same as this one actually as well. It's got the same kind of mud guards and stuff on it, so it must be the same year. Okay, let's get the uh, multimeter again and find out if we're charging. Right, multimeter is on. Start the machine up. Let me just get the camera a bit nearer for you. Okay, you're just hanging in there, magnetised to the fuel tank. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Okay, so we're going to check the stator windings, I think. So we're going to go back into here, unplug that. If we can, come on, you can do it. There we go. That that uh, is the plug to the stator, to the uh, sorry the reg rectifier unit. This is the loom of the bike. Now, if we just do this, put it onto ohms. There we go. Look, and basically we should get the same read. I don't know what the specs are yet. I have got a manual for it somewhere. And the three stator windings are these three down the bottom. So we should get the same resistance at least across all three pairs should be pretty damn low as well so 0 0.3 0 0.2 0 0.3 okay so we'll just check our internal resistance which is bugger all ok 
Okay, so 0 0.4, and we're getting 1.3, weren't we? So let's have another little look. There we go, look. Okay, so we're getting about 1 ohm resistance. Let's try the next pair. So we should just get the same across the board. Yep, that's the same again. And lastly, the two outer ones. Very similar at least. Let's get a better connection. There we go, look. Okay. So now what we need to do is make sure that there's no continuity to ground. So we're just going to move this across um, to the old beepy beep. And then we'll do each of the windings, so each of the other yeah, windings down to bike ground which is that one there that'll do so that's uh, that tells us the insulation is good yep that's cool that's cool okay let's go and take a look in the service manual which I have and find out what the specs are for that stator oh, it was going so well too wasn't it we were cracking on with the jobs and now we've gone down this rabbit hole of no charging Okay, so I have got the service manual for that particular bike, the DR200SE. And, believe it or not, I've even got the additional information that they use at Suzuki to convert that bike into an official farm bike. Look at that. So I'll have a look in there as well. It's pretty cool. It tells them what they need to do to modify it to get it to meet that spec. This bulletin is to inform you the service information for the above model. Wow, SL5 it's called, is the farm bike. 20th of May 2014, this is a, basically an internal document. Yes, I like secret stuff. Pretty cool. Okay, we digress. Right, charging specs, let's take a look. Okay, I only got this printed last week. So, electrical system, 6. So let's flick across to 6. Five chassis. It's really good, actually. I always make a point of sourcing the manual because it's amazing how much information you get out of these things. Electrical. Here we go. Okay, so jump the gun there. Right. So charging system six dash four, six dash two. There's the page number up there. Look. 6-4 okay so this is our system here those are the three windings inside the stator and let's see if we can find some specs there goes the there goes the rain okay so we can also check the output of the stator using our multimeter on AC we, we're going to do that shortly but I wanted to see if it gave us a resistance check See, it should be charging output should be between 30, oh man, that's high, 13 to 16 volts DC at 5,000 RPMs. So that was that fast charge test that we did. Okay, and it should be more than, so no load performance, more than 60 volts AC at 5,000 RPM. Does it give us a, oh, there we go, look, here's a range. Perfect, okay, so we've got our on ohms, which we were, we were on. It's a standard resistance. 0 0.1 to 1 1.5 ohms, and we were getting about 1.2, 1.3 minus the resistance of the meter, which was taking us down to about 1 ohm. So we were basically banging the middle of spec almost. Okay, so the next job is to do the AC voltage output test. Just to cover that a bit closer for you, there you go, look. AC voltage output test, more than 60 volts AC at 5,000 RPM. Hopefully, I won't get a shock. Here we go. Okay, so multimeter is going to go on voltage AC. That's the one with the wavy line. And the range we want is... Uh, we're going to go for 60 volts, won't we? So we'll probably get away with that one. Okay, now you've got to tell me if you can't see the screen or not. Can you see that? 
I don't know, I'm on the wrong side of the workshop. You can't, can you? What if I do that? Yes. So I'll just go up a little bit more. There we go. How's that? Perfect. Okay, let's get this machine fired up again. Remember that our stator windings are here in the plug. So I'm going to be doing the voltage AC across each pair. So we've got 87 volts on the first pair. Let's just move that across to another winding now. Let's get it fired up. So again, about 87. I'm only approximating the RPM, but it's way over spec, and we're probably not up to 5,000 RPM at the moment. Okay, so we've done those two, and we've done that one and that one, so now we need to do that one, and that one as a pair. Okay. Okay, so it looks like the three tests that we've done so far, that's an ohms test, a resistance check on each of the stator windings, that was a pass. Uh, we did a, an insulation test to ground for each of those windings to make sure that none of them were making contact with you know, battery negative or, or the frame of the bike, the earth side of the circuit, and that was all good. And then we did a final test on AC voltage output of each of the uh, stator windings, or each pair actually of the stator windings, uh, at around about, give or take, 5,000 RPM, probably we were down a little bit low, and we got 87, 90, 85 volts, way above the 60 volts AC that the service manual spec indicates. So, at this point in time, we can go, you know, the stator's good, let's leave that alone. Uh, the regulator we have to assume is faulty. Now we know the battery is good as well, so we can forget all of that. We've tried the bike's original regulator, which was this one here. That was obviously faulty, that's what flagged the fault to start off with. We then grabbed another one from a donor bike outside that was exactly the same part. Put that on, that didn't work either. If anything, it was worse. All we have left is this one. This is the one that's got the two plugs. We don't want the two plugs, we want one with a single plug. So, without spending any money, what I now need to do is swap the plugs across. I was almost going to say maybe we should just use some fly leads between the plugs to just to test it. We could do that. It's going to involve five fly leads. I'll get it set up and we'll see if this one works. And if it does, then it's worth spending the time changing the plug on it onto that one. Shouldn't take too long to do though. What kind of... Oh yeah. Okay. And we've got males in both, so fingers crossed I can just just slot them in straight away actually. That might even be easier. Let me see what I can come up with. Back in a second and it's time for another cider. <clears throat> Right, let's see if we can do this. So we need this plug to go onto these wires. So, let's do that red one first, so we can get that out, right? There's a little tine just down the inside. I've just got a cheapy cheap watchmaker screwdriver here. You can do it. You can get proper kits for doing this kind of stuff, but Take that out. We'll just do one at a time so we don't mix everything up. Give that. Ooh, she's a bit crusty. 
get a bit of a clean while it's out. It much needs a job if we can save the plug. Oh, look at that. Beautiful, look at the state of that. Right, I'll give that a bit of a clean. Give it my cloth. There we go. Oh, wrong one. Where are we? Oh no, that's going to break off. <laughs> Oh, that plan failed, didn't it? Damn. Okay, plan B. Let's stick that back in there. No. Yes, that one. Stick that back in there. I'll just cut the wires, I think. So we'll just bend that little tine back out again. So it's going to clip in. There we go. We'll just do the yellow ones, I think. So it goes in that way around. There you go, you heard it click. Right, let's take the three yellow ones out, we don't need those. Now the three yellow ones can be all, doesn't matter which way around they go. I'll just bend all three tabs. Oh, thunder. Cool. Can't beat a good thunderstorm. Well, the power might go off. It's alright, we've got Torchy. Okay, so I'm just going to, I need that connector, so I'm just going to snip these wires and we'll have, to, we'll have to just join the black and the yellow one, the black and the uh, red ones together. Right, so we know that this, this regulator is definitely faulty, we know that, so we'll, we can cut them back here somewhere and give us plenty of, plenty of wire to play with. There we go. Don't need that. Okay, let's get rid of that one out of there. The, this one might be all right. Let's have a look. Doesn't look anywhere near as bad. Right. Tell you what. If we're going to do them both, we may as well just do them both, eh? What the hell? So we'll snip that. We'll snip that. And we'll clean those, just strip those back ready. That's warm. It's a bit corroded that wire lock. I'm sure it'll do for what we want. Okay. Right. Now, let's see if we can get these three out of here and into that other plug. Start with that one, I think. Oh, corrosion everywhere. Two and one more. There we go. Right, let's give those a little, a little clean. Because these, obviously, these run uh, AC voltage, all name current through here, so. If they have a bad contact, they tend to get hot and they burn real quick. That's often the demise of these plugs. So it's best to clean them up now while we can. Oh, the audio is going to go completely mental now. Run out of deoxy spray, so that's not going to happen. But I think the old school way of just using a bit of emery cloth or sandpaper is probably just as good. <laughs> I 
They've had some massive floods in the, south, in the northern part of the South Island. When I was down there last week, the rivers were really, really high, and Timaru has just been put on a state of emergency, which is interesting. Right, last one. We are hoping this reg rectifier actually works. Problem is, I don't have any means of testing a reg rectifier. So you test the stator, and if that's good, then the only other component in the circuit other than the wiring is the reg rectifier unit. So you, you have to assume that that's the faulty thing. That's how we do it. Right. So we're just going to bend that tab back. So it clips in nicely. There we go, that's that one. I'm just trying to be careful because I don't want these connections to break. There we go, that should be good enough. Okay, so we get the plug and they go in that way around. Oh yeah, look at that, that's one. Two. Three. Excellent. Okay. So all we need to do now is join these wires together and then we're good to go so we don't need all of this so let's just trim it down right about there that should work shouldn't it I'm just going to shorten this a little bit <laughs> it's all full of mud <laughs> This is join those now, and we can stick some of this. Oh, let's just snip that off. Just pull those wires out. That's redundant now. Oh, there we go. Now it's probably a little bit long, so we'll just trim that down. Stick that up there. So. As you can see, well, maybe a bit shorter, I've just got those, so wrong around, those to join together. So I'll do that and then we'll try it on the bike. Right, everybody tells me off my soldering, but it's alright. There we go. Right, we're just going to get a little bit of solder on each of these. Hopefully, it's going to flow. That one. There you go. Now, this is all I've got for heat shrink, so we don't need all of that. We'll just pop that down. Hopefully, it's not going to be too long. Oh, it's going to get hot, isn't it? Damn. Tell you what, we'll do without that. Now, forever, I might be able to get on from the other end. We'll see. Okay, what door is actually on? Left handed, I tend to burn my fingers. That's that one. Not to aim the torch towards anything important. There we go. That's one. Perfect. Okay. We can use yellow this time. I haven't got any black left. It's alright because nobody will ever see it. Okay, 
So we just need to join these two together. Bodged one. You'd be surprised how many reg rectifier units are interchangeable between different models and brands of motorcycles. You could even buy um, generic ones aftermarket for this kind of stuff. Okay, we're going in. Wait for the smoke. Right, she's on. Holy moly. Right, ignition on. dropping 12.8 ignition on that's the headlight on now so we can see the volt drop with the headlight on oh I can't start it with a clutch lever damn hang on a minute <laughs> Definitely seeing charging now. We've got 14 volts on there, and he said anything between 13 to 16 was good. So, you know what? I think we've fixed it. Well, it turns out we've actually managed to fix it using an old reg rectifier unit off a slightly different model of DR200. And all it took was playing around and swapping that plug out, and of course, setting fire to the cardboard on the bench. But what we saw there was a distinct climbing voltage. Now, remember the battery is pretty much fully charged. It was on charge for a whole day last weekend. So we're not expecting to see a, wow, a huge amount of current flow into the battery. It's not accepting much of a charge because it's already fully charged. But, you know, give it a good rev. We got it to about 14, 14.1 volts. Spec is between 13 and 16. So we're well within spec. And then when I turned the ignition off, we could see that voltage drop back down to OCV, volt, open circuit voltage on the battery. Obviously, it's still plumbed into the loom, but it, it gives you an indication that the voltage is higher with the bike running and not lower like it was before. So there's definitely a charge going on. So I'm quite happy with that. We can sign that one off the list and get back to pulling that rear wheel out, changing some spokes, fit the chain and sprocket kit, a new rear tyre, 
fixing the back brake, and then I've got the front end to do. Here we go. Holy moly, the rain is pouring down now. Right, to get the rear wheel out, I want to check out, check out the rear brakes and stuff. You can see this bent arm here, look. Hopefully we'll have a spare one on another bike. This is completely, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the wrong bolt for this application. It looks like something that's come from Mitre 10. It's not, or B&Q if you're in England, this is not an automotive bolt. Somebody has done a bodge. Lots of washers and bits and pieces. So it should be an M8 bolt that goes through there to hold that on. Because if this drops off, this can then spin around. Well, it has got, oh there you go, look, it has got a bit of a bit of a thing going on here, but it's that bar that stops this from turning when you apply the brake. Right, okay, let's get this wheel out before it floods. Jeez. Okay, that wasn't too bad. Right, other side. And we're going to need a hammer, we are going to need a hammer. Jeez, not sure about that, whether that should be there or not. Oh, no, maybe it should actually, because it's on a raised piece there, but okay. We'll let them off. Oh. Oh. Hey, come back. I'm just going to whip the chain guard off, because it's really sort of in the way at the moment and it's it's so quick to remove it would be silly not to really wouldn't it Spaces and all sorts of shit falling out. But the manual will tell us where they all need to go, which is a bonus because it looks to me like some of this stuff isn't standard or it could be in the wrong place. We'll have a look. Right, so get rid of the drum. Oh, at least the shoes look good. Look at the rust in there. We need to get that all clean out, don't we? Wow. So just a new arm to fit on that. That should be good. Okay, let's go get the tyre taken off. got a rim lock, a bead lock, I don't like those. That might get deleted. We're not going to run it real low on pressure. Yeah, we'll get rid of that. We don't need it. If you've got to let your tyre pressure down, you're not a good enough rider, is my book. That's what I say. Right, we need a spanner for that, which looks like 14. We need a 12 for that one. Right, let's do this one first. We'll stick a new tube in when we rebuild it and the new tyre. At the moment, it's these broken spokes that I'm worried about. That's plan A, get those fixed. Broken spokes are no good to anybody, are they? Right, that's that one. I think we found four. Oh, look. Very surprising, actually. Right, time to break the bead. Right, you precariously magnetise the back of that bike that's on the stand. It's pretty cool, isn't it?
Not too fussed about the tube. Not the end of the world. Plenty of new ones. It's probably pretty old in there. This is one of the reasons why I don't like B blocks because it makes it a real pain in the ass. Even worse putting it on. To be honest. bad neck. Shame. Right. Okay, to the bench. Right, we've got the, the old tyre, tube and everything off that rim. We have the rim right here. So we can pull out, I think the first thing to do is get rid of this old sprocket because it's really sharp. See how warm those teeth are? That's what the farmers do to bikes over here. It's horrific, isn't it? They wear them out, literally. So we'll get rid of that sprocket because it's sharp, get that in the bin. And then we'll take out the, uh, the broken spokes. And I've already stripped the donor wheel. Now, somebody else may say, well, why are you not swapping the wheel? But this one has a problem with the bearings in the hub. They're loose. Somebody's already tried to fit one in there and it's obviously not been tight in the hub anymore. So they've scrapped the wheel. Another reason why these bikes get scrapped, basically. But we have got some good spokes in there, so let's get that, uh, that sprocket taken off and then see how many spokes we need and how long they are. Match them up from this wheel, take them out, put them in, in, the, uh, in the normal rim, in the original rim, and then hey presto, away we go. The other thing I have spotted is this is a steel rim around here, and this one has an alloy rim. Jeez, there goes a spoke. Hopefully the spoke's the right length. If they're not, I have a problem. <laughs> that thunder's really loud at the moment. <laughs> now, hopefully that's not going to mess up the camera. It might do, might it? Okay, well, just hang in there. Um, these are going to be real tight to get out because there should be thread lock. Which doesn't look like there is, but there should be thread lock on those bolts. Last thing you want is your sprocket you're going to lose. Hang on a minute, Let's see if we can do something about this. Uh, bit of cardboard, that might help damp it down a bit. Now also notice there's no cush drive system by the looks of it. <laughs> that was loose. Uh, on these sprockets. So. Jeez. 
any kind of use on tarmac where you're a bit heavy with the gear changes and maybe you know banging it into gear there's no give and you can easily da cause damage to the transmission embedded is uh, super motard modification um, from the um, from the off-road on his dirt bike I made damn sure that he bought rims that had the, the cush drive system built in because the last thing I wanted to do was to do a rebuild on his gearbox and his bike's done nearly 20,000 kilometers now without any problems and he, he rides like an idiot believe me okay well that is scrap I think probably what we're prudent to do now is just check to make sure that the sprocket we've been supplied, the new rear sprocket, is actually the right one and will match this stud pattern. If it's not, then I can order the right one next week. Okay, so this one is a JR, JTR 811-48. 48 is the number of teeth. And let's take a look. I'm pretty sure Ian would have got it right. But we will just check. Uh, of course, the plastic coating's in the way. Right, it's going to be those bolt holes there. Look. And hey, Presto, we have the right size. That's great, isn't it? Good job, Ian. Thank you for that. Holy moly. Okay, that can go for scrap. Okay, so Mr. Spokes, then we've got this one here. That would have gone to there. So maybe we should just label these up because I'm terrible at getting them wrong. Okay, so I'm pretty confident that one went to there because we can look four across one, two, three, four, and that's that one. So, yes, so we'll just put a little one there. And we'll put a one on the rim there, look. So we know that's where it goes. Take that out. Need one of those. Bring it round. Any more loose ones around there? Yeah, doing pretty well. There, there is another one, look. Okay, so that one goes to there. So we'll have that as number two. And we'll put a two there. I'll take that one out. I think there was four really counted. They're good, they're good, they're good. That one's already missing. It hasn't got a number, so that'll be number three. Oh, and there's one there as well, so... Jeez, okay, so we're missing all of those. Alright, so that one went to there. So, one, two, three, four. Hang on. One. Two, three, four, one. So that's that one there, look. Sorry, that one there goes to there. So we'll have that as number three. So we'll get rid of that one. It looks like they're all on this on this drive side. And we've got the next one, which is that one missing, which comes around to here. So that'll be number four, we'll call that. And four onto there. Right, so pretty sure that all the rest, there's the other spoke, look, it fell out. Pretty sure. They're all good. Now obviously the, the, the rim will be out of true now because some of the spokes are missing and it's all going to be pulled off, uh, off, you know, off trueness. But we can soon fix that. Right. There we go. So we've got four broken spokes, they're all on this side, which is the drive side, this is where the sprocket goes, there's a lot more force, you know, it's these spokes really that are transferring the drive in the main. Okay, so it's the ones with the rivets facing up on the drive side, okay, let's get some taken out of the other rim. Right, drive side, this is pretty rusty, so we want there's your rag. It's been outside, it's been raining. Alright, so what we want are these spokes here, so we'll just put a circle around there, look, that's the ones we want. And we need four good ones, which may mean we've got to take more than four out. Okay, we need some uh, 
some spray first. So let's do this one here. You can see me on the camera, can't you? So let's just pop a bit, of, a bit of spray on all of them actually. So we're going to be that one, that one, and that one for now. Okay. This is quite a neat little tool actually. This is from DRC and it's a spoke spanner and it's got interchangeable ends. Now there's a 5.8 on this end, which I reckon this is probably about the right size. Not bad. I don't want to risk rounding it. Oh, cracked it off. Hang on, we might have a better one. Hang on, so I can, what's this end got on it? A six, let's take that end off and try a 5.6. What's this one? That's a seven, that's no good to us. Should be a 5.6 somewhere. There we are, 5.6, okay. So I'll wind that one on. That should give us a really good tight fit for cracking them off. Now we were doing that one, weren't we? Hang on a minute. Oh, it's a 6.6, .6. what a donkey. See, getting old. That's no good, no, no good. What's this one? That looks huge. 6.8, no good. 6.2, no good. Oh, 6.4, no good. What's this one? 5.6, look at that, perfect. Okay, we'll try again. See, no script. Okay, I'm going in. Now, normally, when you come to undo spokes, they tend to be absolute assholes and usually a seized up and snap. So to get one undone, especially in the first one, it's pretty good going actually. Now you can use a screwdriver on the uh, the actual nipple of the spoke, which is this one here. Look, the actual fact the one we're doing is that one there. So I can put a screwdriver on there now. And you can use an electric drill if you're doing loads of them. Just to finish it off, because, you know, they take time. It takes a long time to build a wheel and strip a wheel. I should know. I've done a few. Now, the other problem we might face is we may not be able to get this spoke out. You know, we might need to take other spokes out to get this one out. We'll see. Oh, look at that. Just perfect. Well, if we can get one out, we can get them all out that we need. So there's a spoke and a nipple. Right, next one. We did spray it, didn't we? 5.6. We should really check, before we go any further, really, that these spokes will actually fit the other rim. With the other rim being an alloy rim, it might be slightly different. I know they take the same tire size, so I think we're gonna be all right. because it is the same hub. I'll wing it, let's take them all out first and then we'll, then we'll hope for the best, eh? All right, let's get that out of there. Oh, come on, you can do it. That's it. Sometimes you just gotta, I mean, sure, I could cut, I could cut some other ones out if I wanted to. There we are, look, you see? Two. Right. Number three, that one there, look. Five point six is that one. And it really does pay to have a decent a decent spoke spanner because otherwise you can't really grip onto them. You don't want to use mole grips because you'll just chew the crap out of the nipples. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? Should get Lily doing this. <laughs> Why did I think of that all of a sudden? I'm in so much trouble with the wife. Okay. Okay, well that's three out of three. We're doing we're doing bloody well actually. I wasn't expecting this. Normally farm bikes are the worst.
with you. Right. Yes, I could have bought new spokes, but geez, yeah. It all costs money on a bike that only costs 50 bucks. It's more fun actually getting it going with very little expense. Anyone could spend a ton of money on something. Right, we need one more. And that one more is going to be that one. So we need some spray on there. There we go. Now you'll be careful when you're doing this because obviously we're taking some tension off. We're taking you know, four spokes out which means the tension on the other spokes is actually increased well, on some of them at least the ones on this side here are actually increased which means you might actually have a spoke break while you're doing this so it's probably a good idea to wear some eye protection and just be just be a bit wary but it's a possibility at least right so we're gonna get this one out bend it a little bit to facilitate the start. Oh. Yeah, brilliant. Right. I don't need this anymore. This can go away. Back on the scrap heap. Wheel back, alloy rim back. Spokies, where are we? Shouldn't call them that really, should I? One, two, three, four. Okay, are they going to work? I don't know, we'll find out. So there's a... There's one. It's got to end up over there. So we've got to get over that spoke there. Look, that was the problem because we had to bend it before. And I'm not taking other spokes out to fit it. That's not what I want to do. Where's my flies? That's a really good point. Where are the flies? There we go. Right, family pliers after all that. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Right. You can draw that through. I'm just going to keep well off the threads. that round. There we go. Right. And then, <laughs> it feels a bit long. It just seems to look a bit long, but anyway, we'll, we'll persevere. There we go. Slightly bent, Mr. Young, but hey, it'll straighten out. Okay, one nipple. So we'll start that on there. I don't want to use too much lubricant because these things can actually work themselves loose if you put uh, put lubricant on them. I think we're going to be all right, you know. All right, so I would say we'll probably a couple of mil longer than the uh, the spokes on this hub. Right, 5.6 again. Now I'm not going to do the final true at the moment, I'm just going to tweak these up to about the same tension as the others. Okay, so in the interest of not having too long a video, I'm always in trouble for that, uh, you've already seen me fit one of the replacement secondhand spokes into this rim. They do work, which is great news. So I'm going to fit the rest of them. Um, I'll, give, I'll check the bearings on the rim. I'll true the rim up. Uh, and then I'll come back and we'll start fitting the uh, the big sprocket, the the rear sprocket, and um, and then we'll you know I'll clean out that drum because it's all rusty in there, and then we'll get the wheel put back in the bike and we'll finish off the chain and sprocket kit today, and then uh, we'll see what time it is. Right, see you shortly. Man, it's one of those days today. It's really hot and muggy. We've just had a big thunderstorm. But it's it's not really clear the air unfortunately. Um, I realised that Benjamin Young has stolen my truing stand. Ben, if you're watching this, I need it back. So I had to come up with an alternative way of truing the rim. Let me show you what I did. 
So I used my DTI. Now, I mounted the rim of the wheel, the whole complete wheel, in the vise using the rear wheel spindle. Now, there's very, very little movement on that. It's only a fraction, so I was quite happy with that. And when it's spinning, it doesn't really seem to move from side to side. Tolerance, believe it or not, on a motorcycle, I think is usually about two millimeters, which is massive. But I always try and get them as good as I can. So I used the DTI, mounted the back of the vise, and then just set the arms. It was just um, occasions would be in contact with, you can just hear it just tick the rim. And that's how the truing stand works, you know, you can adjust it so that you can just get it in. And I can use this little knob here to adjust. There you go, look. So you can actually hear where the rim is high and you can look for the gap where it's low. So let's do a close up so you can see exactly what's going on. So there you go, as I spin the wheel, you can see we've now got a datum, we've got a point of reference here. And of course, you know, you can then also set this bar up vertically. I'll just use the vertical bar off the actual uh, magnet base itself. So then you can adjust the lift of the rim. But like I said before, there is uh, there's a video already on the channel, a pretty extensive video on replacing the spokes and truing up a wheel off one of uh, Ben's motorcycles, a TDR250, believe it or not. But this one, I'm quite happy with the amount of uh, lateral movement on that. It's minuscule for a farm bike. <laughs> Some new ones are worse than that, believe me. Okay, we'll crack on. Right, so what's next? Well, I think, I think we'll fit the rear sprocket. We'll do that first, and then we'll fit the tyre. We'll put a new um, rim tape on there and a new tube in as well, just to be on the safe side. There's no point, you know. I have no idea the history of the old ones, uh, of the old tubes, so we'll just chuck a new one on, have done with it, and then we can move on and get the wheel back in the bike, because the clock is ticking, and I know I'm not going to get old on today, but I really do need to break the back of all this work. Okay, one sprocket. First job, we need to just wire brush around where the sprocket sits, because it, it's hub mounted on this hub here, look. So we'll just get rid of all that. A bit of corrosion on there. Now kit, all that kind of stuff. Excellent. Okay, so it's usually a number to the outside. This is a... Hang on a minute. That's a C49 on there, and it's... 48 tooth sprocket, that's weird. Okay, so that's pretty tight fit. And you've got to make you've got to make sure it goes all the way down. Which it should pull on with the bolts. There we go. There we go. Right, we're in. Right, so we're gonna use some Forge K120 blue thread lock. Now this is for non-permanent. This is when you want to re you know disassemble the items later on in the future. So pretty good gear. First time I've used it. But uh, we'll find out, eh? Now, as regards the torque setting for these bolts, I had a quick scan of the manual. I'll have my afternoon coffee. And it tells us in here, on there, look, 27 Newton meters. And it tells us to apply some thread lock, Super 1303 Suzuki thread lock, that is. Um, what's it called there, look? Yeah, thread lock Super. Bloody good stuff. Okay, so we'll get that uh, sprocket bolted up. And then we get the tire put on, can't we? Right, so we've got six bolts. And by the looks of it, these have never had any thread lock put on them, so now's a great time, isn't it? Now with thread lock, don't forget less is more. Beautiful. That's a funny noise, isn't it? Sounds like it's in pain. Oh. Right, there's one. I'm buzzing down with the uh, with the impact wrench just lightly. Save a bit of time. It does surprise me the maintenance on some of these vehicles. Um, a lot of stuff gets overlooked and not done. And thread lock on these bolts. Obviously, it's had new sprockets at the back before it must have done. And whoever's fitted that sprocket hasn't put fresh thread lock on. Most bizarre. Don't quite understand why that doesn't happen, anyway. Right, we'll just turn it down. I just really want to snug them up. I think 
this thread lock down the actual threads in the hub. Hang on, let's just go back for higher power again. So I think actually talking these down is probably going to be futile because there's probably more than 27 newton meters just to get the bolt down the threads. But we'll, we'll give it a go. That's that one. Oh yeah, there we go. Look. That's that one. Cool. Cool. They are all turning a bit, which is good news. Perfect. We'll just go around again. So the last thing you want is a sprocket coming loose because if it does, it can damage the hub. Obviously, damage the sprocket and tear all the threads out of the hub and everything. So it become a really big problem. Okay, so sprocket is on. I think I'll uh, I'll just give this a bit of a clean out with some emery cloth, and then we can go around and fit the tire on the tire machine. Perfect. Cooking on gas this afternoon. Right, easy job while the wheels out, obviously. I imagine this bike must have been parked up for quite. Oh my word! Sorry, camera. Must have been parked for quite some time actually. So it uh, starts to rust in here. But we'll just give it a light sand. Just get rid of that, the bulk of that surface rust. Thundering outside. And now poor old Timaru's getting on. They've got massive floods down there. And late, late Wanaka, I read on the online, late Wanaka's flooded as well. So please don't live down there. Right, that'll do. Perfect. Well, you know what we should do at the same time? We should do the brake shoes. I mean, he's still got a bit of rust to transfer across to these as well, so we'll just give those a quick sand off. Check that's going to return like so, and it is. See there, look, moves quite freely. So no need to strip all that down. That's great. Okay, what I do need to do is change that arm. You see the arms all bent. So I'll dig a new one out from somewhere. I'll fit that later on. Okay, right. Tire time. Right. First job, we'll give it a bit of a wire brush. Then. See if there's any kind of corrosion in here. Pretty damn good nick. Thank <laughs> you. 
you. Now, I always fit the sprocket downwards because it's sharp. And if you slip, you can hurt yourself. Right, rim tape. Okay, nice new rim tape. Where's the valve or valve hole? It was that one, it was rusty, wasn't it? I remember. Stick it on there. Drop that in there. Line it up. Job's a carrot. Right, let's go and find a tire. First job. A bit of lube on the bead of the tire. Both sides, very important. If you haven't got any special tire lube, just use a bit of fair liquid and water. Or shimp liquid, should I say, and a little water. That's all you need. Okie dokie, this tire is not, uh, not directional, so we're all good there. So we need to move that around a bit. Oh, yeah, that's Holy now I've had this tube inflated for a while just make sure there's no leaks. So we're just gonna let the air out. Holy moly, it really is hammering it down like that. Now you do want a little tiny bit of air left in the tube, it just helps you to prevents pinching when you're putting the whole thing together. Okay. You can't have too much, otherwise you can't get it in. God. If only I had the tire machine on wheels, it'd be all right. Now this is a special tire lever that you can get up down onto the far rim, let the tube through, And then you can put the nuts, I've only got an old one, <laughs> put the nuts on the, uh, on the stem, just so it can't go anywhere. Fold the tube over on itself, remove your tool, tie lever, and then bring your tube in. It's really important you don't have any kinks in your tube, once it's installed. I can get them set. Right, there we go. Mix up, back a little bit. Just go back a little bit. Right. You make sure you're down in the well of the rim. do is inflate the tyre. It's always a good idea before you do that actually. Sorry about the audio, it might be really bad. Just push that all the way in, make sure it's not trapped. That stops the, the tube being trapped between the bead of the tyre and the rim itself. And don't tighten it up tight tight yet. We'll do that after it's been inflated. Oh, oh, plenty of air in there. We'll let lay down the pressure a bit later on. Holy moly! Right, 12 minutes time. Right. Welcome to New Zealand. Yeah, and we've got a spare valve cap. Oh, yeah. Right, 
Back to the bench, please. Holy shit! Really is hammering it outside. We'll have to stop the video until the audio comes back because I bet you can hardly hear me at the moment. I can hardly hear myself think. Right, time for a cider, I think. Catch you shortly. Listen, it's finished. Torrential downpour number three is over for today. Now, wheels all done, tyres on, sprockets on. Tyres massively overinflated at the moment just to get the seat properly. We'll, we'll drop the pressure down a bit later on. We've cleared the drum out uh, of all the rust that was there. Now we need to sort out the, the shoe carrier plate, the backing plate for the shoes and get rid of that bent arm. And I've been outside in the rain and found another arm. Yes, it's a bit rusty, but it's not bent, so it should work. I also found off the same bike, the brake pull rod. So we've got that as well now, plus all the little bits and pieces that we need to get the rear brake sorted out. So let's crack on and get this uh, rear brake done, and then we can get the wheel back in and oh, call it a day, and I can go and edit some more videos then. Right. In fact, it rained so hard, some rain came in the garage. It's not good, is it? Right, what we're going to need? Well, ratchet, I suppose. There we go. 10 mil. Oh, look at this. Okay, I'm not sure you can see this on camera or not, but I'll turn that around. We have a line on the, the cam that uh, operates the, the shoes. There's the line, look, just emphasised. So I'll show you that, and then I'll show you what it says in the manual. There's the picture on the manual. Can you spot the difference? Hopefully you can. Anyone that's worked on motorcycle drum brakes before, especially Japanese ones, you'll know straight away that this line here should line up with the, the gap in the clamp, the spline clamp. And basically what's happened is somebody's moved it further round to compensate at some point for worn brake shoes. Now I don't know if that's the reason why this is bent, but it may well be they've had to put additional force on the brake lever, the foot brake lever, to try and get some kind of braking effort. And that's caused it to bend. If only they'd left it where it was and fitted new brake shoes when it needed to be. And these are the original shoes, well, looks good, unless they've used you know, genuine shoes in it. But Suzuki, the bike's only done 5,000 Ks from new, which is not a lot. These tend to last quite a while, so it does seem very strange why somebody hasn't lined up that, uh, that clamp up correctly. Obviously, we will. Okay, moving on. And don't forget, these bikes are used in a, uh, a commercial environment as well, so the maintenance is really important. You know, if a worker gets injured on a bike commercially, then they have every right to, to sue the company. It's not good at all, is it? Right, so that's our bolt and nut, and the nut goes towards the centre on that side. Now, let's see how we're going to get this out. Normally, I just shock them out with a hammer. Let's see if that's going to work. Give it a little tap. There we are, look. It's probably got it going. Oh, a bit more. Where's a punch? Let's use a punch. There we go, half off. It's a bit more tight than normal because it's, uh, well, it's been buggered, basically, hasn't it? You've got to line the splines up and stuff. I wonder if we can just whack a screwdriver down there and just spread it open a bit because it's going to go in the bin, isn't it? Clearly. You can go a bit further yet. There we go. Oh, yes. Professional. Right, <laughs> he says. Okay, so under here we've got a little o ring. And as you can see, they get really, really, really dry. And these actually cause the whole thing to bind. Where's my pliers? Here, look, sir. So if you find that this is binding big time on the, you know, on the actual uh, cam in there, you see, see how quickly it snaps back now? That o ring 
actually causes it to bind up. It's designed to keep the dirt out, but it, when it goes dry, it actually grips the shaft and provides a lot more uh, resistance, which you, do, you don't want. You know, you want this to spring back as quickly as you can. So we'll stick a bit of grease on there, and that should help. Right, little screw. Jeez, okay. I'm just going to put a bit of grease around the O-ring. That should help it to... I mean, if I was overhauling the brakes properly, I would take the cam, the shaft out, clean it all up, grease it. Use that lots on little Honda C50s and stuff, but I'm not doing that today. Just getting this thing working. Now, the offset on there goes outwards. So that should, in theory, line up like that. There we are, look, give it a little tap. I've got to make sure that it's lined up properly. There we go. So basically, if you look down there, you've got to have that on far enough so that the, the, the groove in the cam shaft, so to speak, the actual shaft that runs through, is also lined up with the arm so you can actually get the bolt through. Easy, isn't it? Right. So, we should have a nut on there now. Oh, it's so easy, isn't it, when you know what you're doing? To be fair, we don't really do drum brakes anymore, do we? There's not many out there. Most stuff is all disc brake. Now, the torque setting for this is 11 newton meters. That's not a lot. Click. There we go. Perfect. Manufacturer's specs. Right. So what we need to do now... There we go. One thing I have spotted. There's quite a bit of wear on there. Can you see the difference in the thickness? That's about half the thickness of what's there. So that, that um, the little barrel that sits in there on the donor bike is loose. You can see the movement on there, look. It's not the end of the world, but imagine if that was to tear open whilst you're panicking and pressing the brake and that goes clink and pulls out. No rear brake. I think it'd be fine for what we want. It's not going to get much use from now on. Now, I also did find a new bolt for the, the, the stay that comes down. And I'll show you the difference. This is, this is the correct bolt. If you turn it over, there's actually a, a casting in there, an indent where the bolt head fits in. So it becomes captive. And that's how it should be. Not that bloody bolt we had in there before, that little M6 thing. Terrible. Okay, so we've done all we need to do to this now. We can refit this into the wheel and get the wheel back on the bike. I almost forgot. We're putting a new chain and sprockets on this bike, so we need to cut the old chain off first before we stick the wheel in. It makes it a lot easier. There's no point in threading the old chain back on the sprocket when we're putting a new chain on. So, grind us the rescue. Now, obviously, make sure that you're wearing your safety squints for this and make sure there's no petrol leaks. Otherwise, it's going to become a really warm day. Easy when you've got a new battery. Okay, so the bike should be in neutral, so we should be able to pull that off. Oh, 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 straight out. Right, time for the bin for that. Okay, now we can chuck the wheel in. First job is we need to grease up the axle. This is where you get your hands all grubby. I'm not wearing gloves today for some strange reason. Normally I do. Now you don't need lots, but you do need some. Because you'll thank me next time you have to take it out. It won't be seized in. A lot of Harley Davidson motorcycles come out of the factory with no grease on these spindles. When we came around to fitting the first new tyre, Usually it would be a year or whatever after the bike had been born. Man, they were an absolute asshole to get out. They really were. Not a fan of those. Right. Okay. So now we don't have to worry about the chain, which is great. It saves a lot of time. Now these are the bits that fell off this side. And there was that. Which goes in there. Just tilt it on an angle slightly. That goes in there. And then there was also a washer that fell out. Now, I'm not entirely sure if all of this is standard stuff, so we should really go look in the manual before we go any further. 
make sure there haven't been any additional parts fitted because we know that the previous mechanic was pretty creative on parts, wasn't he? Let's go and check. Okay, sorry for the small diagram, but it's the way it is. So, starting at the spindle end, we've got the snail cam, and then we have a washer go behind the snail cam. On the other side of the swing arm, we've only got this part here, and the larger diameter goes to the swing arm itself, and the smaller diameter onto that brake backing plate. I'm sure I saw a washer in there as well, one of these washers actually. Now, this washer is that washer there, and there is no washer on the outside of the cam. It's just the, um, the axle, straight onto the axle head, straight onto the cam. So we need to remember that. Now, at the other end, we've got the spacer which fits in the swing arm, that's already in. We've got, again, this time this spacer which goes between uh, the hub and the uh, the swing arm and again I'm sure there was a washer in there as well but this there shouldn't be it's just that spacer and that's it normally you wouldn't get loads of washers because they just make the spacer wider you know and then we've got a washer on the outside of the swing arm the snail cam another washer and then the nut and then the split pin perfect let's go and do that yeah, it's always helpful to have two people to help you do this especially if you've got a chain to put on as well we chuck that in there now, it's all done. Now, that's the spacer for this side and it needs to go that way around. Like I said before, the bigger diameter goes against the actual swing arm itself. So we'll offer that in for now. We'll just hold, hold that on there. And we need to put the other spacer in as well, which goes on the, spr geez, and that, on the sprocket side, which is that one there, look. And it does sit in a recess, so it should hopefully hold itself in place. That's the plan. Right, so we get this one again. And it goes that way around. Stick it in there. And we're just going to line up, line it up with the actual uh, dowel inside the swing arm. It's not too bad once you get started. Oh my word. What are we forgetting? Well, stay there, wheel. We need, we can't just put the snail cam straight against there because it's, there's a, a, a lip. So the snail cam goes on the shaft, on the actual axle. Then we have a spacer, a washer, that goes on there. That's correct. That then goes in there. And now, for the spacer, stick that in there. A bit fiddly, but we'll get there. Get it started. There we are, look. I've just got to lift the wheel slightly to get it into the drum, into the backing plate. Oh, and you should never hit the axle with the back of your hand. I got told. Okay, right, to the other side. Now, as luck would have it, the spacer is in, it stayed in place. All we need to do now is just lift or tilt the rear wheel so that that's going to go all the way through the actual axle wheel. Oh, look at that. Okay, there we go. And obviously, feel free to use a soft hammer. Now, again, on this side, it needs to have a spacer which goes in there because if you look carefully there's a ridge just there and if you put the snail cam on first numbers to the outside then it's going to catch on that ridge and weld that's why they've put a spacer in there so that goes on there first then we have the snail cam then we have another washer then we have the nut and that believe it or not is what it says in the manual jeez okay that's cool that snail cam's bent. The hell? And that one's a bit bent as well. Okay, well, we'll make it work. I can bend them back in situ. Okay, so we're just going to do that up gingerly, not tight. We're going to push it all the way forwards as well. Because obviously we want to have maximum adjustment on the chain with the new chain. The question is. Oh, it's because that snail cam's bent. Jesus. Okay. There we go. That should be enough. Right, so we're on the last adjustment on there for now. We'll just, just tweak that up lightly just to hold it in place. T. 
temporarily. Fantastic. Right. Well, we need to get that front cover off now, the engine, and replace the front sprocket. That's the next job. Look at that. I didn't even touch the wheel and it's still spinning. And I've had time to get the new, all the tools that I need. Right. 8mm socket. Buzz these off. That's one. That's the rear one. Because they could be different lengths. That's they are different lengths. That's the top one. And that's the bottom one. Cool here. Okay, now we need to make sure we're in neutral and the sprocket's held on with a 12mm nut. I'm pretty sure it's like its normal thread. Is that what oh it's loose? Oh that's nice. Look at that. Hopefully the shaft's not too warm. Yeah, so we need a 12mm socket for that, and hopefully the impact wrench can get it off. Oh come on, you can do this. Okay, I'm going to get the old chain and just lay it over the top to stop it from spinning. I don't want to put it into gear, because it might damage the gears, and that's not a good idea. I don't want an engine rebuilt. There we go. Okay, let's see if Mr. Impact Wrench can do the job now. Oh, yes. Look at that. Fantastic. That, again, definitely needs thread lock. No question about it. Okay, there is old sprocket with the the shoulder to the outside very important right let's get the new one so don't forget your thread lock we need that right it's the sprocket oh my word this is a lot bigger holy shit look at that oh well it's just gonna go faster right so i'm gonna stick that in the chain the old chain just just so we can tighten the thing up and we're just going to line up the splines and we've got the boss to the outside there we go this thing's going to fly isn't it god i was hoping to gear it down some more but obviously i ordered the wrong sprocket right it's plenty of thread lock well not too not too much actually there we go thread locks on and we're using the blue again the k120 from forge phenomenal stuff <laughs> Right, we're just going to buzz that up for now. There we go. We will be talking that later on, but only once the new chain's actually in situ. Okay, we can get rid of the old chain now. Once and for all. And the rain starts again. Fantastic. Okay, so we've got our new chain, 120 links. Hopefully it's going to be long enough, given that new big, that big sprocket out front. It sort of defeats the whole purpose of having a large sprocket on the rear, but anyway. What will happen there? It won't be Ian's fault at uh, Derby, but it'll be me actually. I think Ben, I, in fact, I remember it's Ben's fault. I asked Ben to count the teeth for me on the front sprocket. And he thought there was 15, and in reality, <laughs> it was 12. Benjamin. Right. There we go. Oh, heavy one enough. Look at that. Right. So, we need to put the chain, we can't put it there because it'll have an overlap, so we're going to need to go back to the back there. Now oh, hang on, that's where we need to put that's. And we'll have to take up that adjustment on the snail cam, but if we go for a whole tooth, well, we can't actually get a whole tooth, we don't have any half links. So now we're going to have to put it first. There. there we go. Right, to the vice. Okay, now we're not going to cut straight through. We need to get rid of this rivet. Here, look. Then we can bend it open and get rid of it. And yes, I know I'm using a slip disc to grind something, but... Hey, sorry about it.
Oh, there's my flat screwdriver. And the hammer. I need the hammer as well, obviously. There we go. Easy. Probably not the industry standard way of doing it, but hey, it does the trick. Now then, all the other bits we need are back over by the bike. Follow me. And the wheel's still spinning. Look at that. Fantastic. quick filming today because I'm in a rush to the hotel. Now we need to remember to go through the guide at the back, unlike we did last time. There we go. Okay, now remember we've got plenty of slack. That's just the way it has to be. Get rid of the safety squints. Now, this one is a split link. It's got a little clip there, look, so it pings into place. So I'm going to get a flat screwdriver again. All right, I have two options, because sometimes we have a pig to do. And we've got O-rings and all sorts of stuff to fit. So, can you see okay? I'm not sure if you can, how. Let's just uh, show you what's inside the packet. Even my trolley got wet. It wasn't even outside. There we go, right. So what's inside? It's an O-ring chain, so we should have a bit of grease. We've got the main pin, We've got the side plate, We've got four little O-rings. And of course, the most important part is the spring clip. You never ever reuse these. You always buy a new one if you have to take it apart. Right, little O-rings, let's get those out. Jeez, my fingers were never designed for this tiny stuff. One, two. I have fitted quite a few chains over the years. I think there's a, a video actually fitting a new chain and sprockets to an XTZ660. A oh, Japanese one. Awesome bike. Oh, I've not it first. They have, look at that. Right, so we've got the grease. That's good to go. Okay. Right, I'll leave you on the little tripod. I can't. You won't get close enough. Hang on. Let's come up with a cunning plan so you can see what's going on. Okay, I think that's going to work for you. So, everyone does this differently, and this is just how I do it. So, if I'm not adhering to the instructions, don't worry about it. It's not the end of the world. Just make sure you follow the instructions that come with your chain. Simple as that, really. So, plenty of grease everywhere, basically. Because you need the grease, or the chain needs the grease, otherwise it's going to wear out. Now, on there... Needs to go a couple of little O-rings. Oh, Mama, it's not happy. She got very wet earlier on. And that one down there, look. And now, that can go in there. Push through. See, when you're pushing it, it springs back because it's riding the O-rings up onto these little shoulders here on the other side. So bear that in mind. Where's my rag? I really need a rag right now. No, no rag? Okay. Right, so the other O-rings go on there, and you can see that they don't want to stay on that little lip, they want to keep springing down, so you, we're going to be fighting everything to get it all squished up. There we go. And of course, just to make matters worse, we need even more grease on there. Wrong one, going blind. There we go, look, that'll do. Grease is grease, it'll find a home. Okay, and the little link obviously lets us the outside if you want to be super professional. And now we've got to try and squish all that up. It'll get to a point where it'll stay in place, it won't keep springing off. Get on there, there we go. Oh, look at that. Professional ish, not really. Now I do have a special DID tool for doing the rivet links and you can actually use that to clamp all this up. 
but I'm not using it specifically because most people don't have one. Uh, but you do have a pair of pipe pliers or you know, a pipe wrench or poly grips or call them what you like. So you need to be able to know how to use standard tools to do a job. Not the specialist tools because not everybody has got the specialist tools. So feel free to put in the comment in the comments, hey Andy, you should have used the DID tool. I could have done, but you can't do most people can't do that. And that's one of the main reasons why they made split links. Right now it's important that we can see the full the full groove is exposed, otherwise you will not get the split link on. That was a bit of a misfire with the grease there. Okay, now this is also very, very important, and it does happen the wrong way around sometimes. People get it wrong. Think of this as an arrow. This is the arrow head, and this is the tail of the arrow. And it points, the arrow points in the direction the chain runs. The wheel goes this way, so the arrow should be pointing towards the gearbox of the bike or the output sprocket when it's fitted at the top of the rear sprocket. Yeah, dead simple. It goes on there. And then, this is the tricky bit, we've got to waggle it into place. And the way I do it is I get a flat screwdriver, usually slip at least three times, leave a bit of skin behind, and there you go, it's on. So I slide the screwdriver down there using it like a wedge, just wiggling it and then it'll click on into place. No hammers, no chisels, no nothing. And it's important that you make sure that it's in place. So let's have a, have a really good close up. All right, bit of freehand, here we go. Is it okay with the light on? I think it is. Yeah, you can see really well what's going on. So that is bang on. It actually helps me because I'm blind these days. That is exactly how it should look. Clipped all the way on and there be no gap here on the spring clip. That should be completely closed. And that's telling us, indicating that the clip is on correctly. And there you go, that's how it should look from the top. You see the little O-rings are all in the right place and everything. Plenty of grease. Can't go wrong. Okay, I can sense it's beer o'clock very shortly, so we'll crack on. Obviously, there is way too much slack on this chain at the moment, so we need to bring the wheel backwards. So now we can just slacken off that bolt, the, the axle nut, and we can start to increase the position of the snail cam. So we'll put it on number one on both sides to start off with. There we go. And of course, a lot better, probably still a bit too much slack. Let's go and look in the manual to see exactly what it says for chain slack. Remember, there's no weight on the bike at the moment. Right, where are we? So, periodic maintenance is chapter two in the book. So we'll flick through to that. It's periodic maintenance, where does it say chain? Drive chain, two dash eight. Okay. 2-8, drive chain, slack. Oh, it gives you a measurement for the links as well, that's pretty cool. So drive chain, 20 pitch length, that's 20 little uh, of the pins. Maximum should be 319.4 millimetres. Well, that's a good fact for a pub quiz, isn't it? Okay, adjusting. So our slack should be between 25 and 40 millimetres of movement up and down. Great stuff. Can you see that? Yeah, look. Make it a bit easier for you. Right, let's head over to the bike and see what we've got. Okay, so 25 to 40 mil. So, if I push it all the way up, I reckon we've got too much. We have, we've got about, ooh, about 60 at the moment. So we'll just adjust that down a bit. Be very conservative with my camera movements at the moment. So, we'll go, I think two clicks after one, so. Two more clicks this side. There we go. Right, let's check that. We're back. Oh my word, that's probably it's probably a little bit too tight. Let's go back one. And obviously there are limits to where you can put this because you you're governed by the by the notches. There we go. Now, I'll show you a little trick. I can't see from there, so hang on. We're going to go up in the world. There we are. Right, before we tighten this down, we've got two things to do, actually. 
Oh, we need to put the stay bracket onto the drum. Let's do that first. So while that spindle is obviously loose, the wheel at the axle, we can move this backing plate. Oh God, it's thundering again. Marmite does not like the thunder. Okay, so we'll pop that on there. Right, 14 mil I think it is. So we can give that a good tweak now because it's, it's in the right place. <laughs> That's reassuring. Normally those bolts, this is the right bolt, but normally they'll have a shoulder on them to stop that from happening. I suppose they're just relying on it being tight and it won't. It won't move around with it. And don't forget to put a split pin in there. We'll do that right at the end. Okay, right, back to the other side. Okay, now before we tighten up the axle on the bike, on the rear wheel, we need to make sure that this, uh, the rear wheel is as far forward and these are all tight. So you just get a 3 8 extension bar, stick it on within one of the teeth, and then pull that back. And that's going to really tighten that chain up and that's going to pull the wheel forwards. And this is standard practice, by the way. It's not just something that I've come up with. I was shown this a few years ago. Well, <laughs> many years ago. We're just going to tweak that up. Now the torque setting for this is 65 Newton meters. So we'll get our torque wrench and we'll set that. But first, let's get it off the stand because it's, it's wobbling around. We should also check that drive chain slack just to make sure it's not gone over slack now that we've pulled the wheel as far forward as we can. Now often, You'll get extra slack now because you've taken up that play. Oh man, we have. Okay, we're going to have to go back or go one more notch. That's all we can do. And this is just the way it is, you know. You, you end up playing around until, you, until you're happy with how it is. So we'll back that off. We're going to go one more notch. There we go. Perfect. One more on this side. Cool. We're going to pull it forward again and we're going to tweak it up. Right, let's go and check it again. Do I need to move you? Yes, I do really, don't I? There we go, look. But you know that I'm not editing the whole thing just for the fun of it. Okay, so 25 to 40 mil, looking at the top of the chain. Oh, look at that. 40 mil. Near as damn it, 40 mil. That'll do. Perfect. Quite happy with that. Right, let's get rid of this, uh, this step, this jack. And then we'll tweak up that uh, axle nut to 65 newton meters. And you look, that's that done. Right, what's that? 65? It is 65 Newton meters, perfect. Okay, it's probably got to turn the wheel in, so we'll get a 17 mil spanner for the other side to hold it. There we go. Perfect, job done. And it is important that you do these up tight enough because if you don't, especially when it's the, well, any kind of adjuster really, but the, the bolt type ones, the bolts can get bent so make sure you do them up the right tightness. Very important. Okay, what's next? Oh, chain guard and oh, we were going to tighten up that front sprocket nut, weren't we? The bolt. Let's go and find out the torque for that. Servicing information 7-17 down here. Look, where was it? Du -du -du. Engine, sprocket, bolt, 25 newton meters. Okay, let's do that. Jeez, I've got some tidying up to do today. Now, what size was it? 12 it was, perfect. Okay, here we go. It's gonna hold the rear, the rear wheel tight. Oh, well, we're already at 25. <laughs> we'll leave that alone. Right, said Fred, sprocket cover going on. Stick it on there. Now then, that's that one. Now 
I do like these electric tools, the rechargeables. You, you've got a lot more control when starting threads. An M6, so be a 10, 10 newton meters, I reckon. It's pretty much industry standard for these kind of things. Right, chain guards next. Pretty easy. But again, aluminium threads, you don't want to over tighten them or you'll tear the thread. And then it becomes a real ball ache. So we'll just be real careful with these because we know that the kind of people that have serviced this bike before and not the best to be fair not too much given what we've seen so far they're a bit alternative and a little bit hand fisted as well come on you can do it get in there just the threads there we go can we get it started we can oh, look at that with a full loop I couldn't really use a ratchet in there because I couldn't quite get in because of the foot peg. Pretty cool, it's still got its chain guard actually. This, this bike really hasn't done a lot of work. It's pretty amazing that they scrapped it, to be honest. Click, there we go. Okay, got one thing left to do and that's the brake rod on the other side. Rain has stopped for about 10 seconds. So we'll just get that put in there, look, I nearly forgot. Don't forget this, whatever you do, because, well, I can speak from personal experience about this coming loose and you losing your brakes. So we'll pop that on there like that. Now, we'll fit the brake rod. Right, so the brake rod, as you well know, goes from the front, from the, from the rear brake pedal, to the arm on the rear brake drum. Pretty important part, to be honest. You really don't want this thing falling off. Now, I believe it goes on that way around. Yes, you can see where the guy's boot's been taking the paint off and stuff. Right, so that goes in there. And then the little, little split link, sorry, split pin goes down the back. Remember, these are really farm bikes. On a road bike, you put, oh no, I dropped it. On a road bike, you probably find there'd be a washer behind there as well to stop the, the wear on the split thing. There we go. And of course, the rain keeps going. Right, that's in place. So you can see now that would pull on the rod when you press the brake pedal. Right, let's zoom in on the rear bit, see what's going on. Hopefully, hopefully, we're going to have to do this end first because the rod's a little bit long to do it the way I normally do it. So that slides on there like that. There's a little bit at the end here that's been bent out to stop the spring from going too far. That then goes through there. Remember, this is a bit worn. It's not good, actually. And then we have the little nut. Now, I'll be actually putting a, a lock nut behind this because I'll tell you a little story at the end of this video of what happened to me. Right, let's get it put on at the, uh, the foot pedal end. Remind me near the end and I'll tell you the story. Okay. <laughs> Normally I would do it at this end first. But for some reason the rod is actually quite long. Didn't want to know. There we go, right, split pin to go in. Where's my little flat screwdriver? There we go, just going to bend that round. And then that way, hopefully, it can't fall off. Right. It needs a lot of adjustment. Now, these threads actually are pretty damn rusty. 
So I'm just going to stick some of this uh, Forge Black Magic on there. And hopefully it's going to allow that bolt, that nut, to ride up there without too many problems. I might even have to get the old wire brush on it. Oh, look at that. It's even got a safety cap. It's that good. Right, put the cap back on. There we go, look. Okay. So, it is a 14. I'm just going to work that in. I'll get the windy gun. You know what I mean, the impact wrench. Oh, it's not happy, is it? Oh, man. I might have to run a die down that, I think. Take it all off again. Oh, back shortly. Just as soon as I finished put running the die down here, the rain started again. Honestly, you can't win today. Out to get me. Oh, and I put, the, I put a, uh, a tap through that as well, just to be on the safe side. Because it wasn't very happy. It wasn't very happy at all, actually. Oh, ho, 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 look at that now. See, it pays just to take that little bit of extra time, doesn't it? Right, let's get this end on. Right, we'll try again. Oh, you've seen this already, but hey, you know. Value for money seeing it twice. There we go. And another new split pin. That's what we do, isn't it? We really wouldn't want to have Lily fall off. Jeez, oh, mechanical failure cause her injuries. That wouldn't work, would it? Right, a bit more. It's a lot of travel. Jeez. Oh, well, let's get it adjusted up. We might run out of adjustment here. This might be the reason why they moved the arm. Maybe it was the wrong one for it or something. Jeez. Are we there? Well, still got full travel going on. And I know for sure that there isn't there aren't many more threads left on there either. Might have to investigate this a bit further. Something is not right. It shouldn't, it shouldn't need this much adjustment because the shoes are in pretty good nick. And so is the drum. I measured that earlier on. It's not actually that worn. So maybe it's the wrong pull rod. I mean, sure, the, the axles is pretty far forward at the moment, given the fact it's got a new chain, so we would see a bit more exposed thread on here, but, you know, it's not, it's not ideal. And we'll give it four just one and see what happens. Plus, there's a bit of wear, don't forget, on the arm as well. And the arm is the right way around. I think we're about near the end. It shouldn't be on the end of its adjustment. There should be lots left because, like I said before, the shoes are in good nick. Oh, maybe only just. Okay, I need to look at that. There's something not quite right there. I think we've got the wrong part. Oh, look at that. Perfect. But, can you guess what I did? Take a closer look. Can you see? Were you watching earlier on? Well, <laughs> I moved the arm, didn't I? So you can see here, look, that's the line on the, on the actual cam on the shaft. And then you can see now that I've moved the arm around, and that's the position that the old one was in. So maybe this is the wrong arm, or it's got the wrong push rod, or something, I don't know, but it will not actually work with the arm in the correct position. I need to do more research. But it'll do for now, won't it? Perfect. Look at this. That is bang on, is that? Quite happy with the way the lever is. Just not happy the way it's uh, how we got there. Jeez, that was quite a long day. I, I came outside this morning at 7am, got a few little jobs done, and I started filming at half past nine this morning, and it's now gone 6pm. And what's held me up has obviously been the rain and the noise. I've had to keep stopping and do other things, but um, we haven't finished. There's still a lot more to do on this video. 
And I could have I could have filmed it in separate videos and done a video on the ignition switch problem um, and, and you know fixing that, um, doing the rear wheel, changing the spokes, truing it up, fitting the tire, fitting the sp and then do a video on fitting the chain and sprockets, uh, another video on fitting the battery and solving the charging system problem, which to be perfectly honest, I was really lucky. It was the last Reg Rectifier that I had for a Suzuki. It would have probably got a Honda one put on if that Suzuki one hadn't have worked. And they're all similar. They work. There's only five wires. What can go wrong? Um, but I didn't. I decided to do a video, um, you know, on really, here's a bike. We've got, you know, a customer list of stuff to do. First of all, the initial inspection. And it just sort of shows how jobs can evolve once you get into them. You know, don't ever let your service, if you're a mechanic, don't ever let your service manager or the reception staff, you know, say to a customer, hey, your car will be ready at this time. You know, if you haven't started the work or taken a look at the car, you have no idea how much work's going to be involved in that car. It might be there for three days. You know, worst case scenario, it might never ever leave the workshop. It might just be condemned and scrapped if it's that bad. Um, and it happened to me, you know, so... It's very important, you know. I think it's it's in, you know imperative that that front of house staff understand that no service is the same. Every single car out there has different faults and different problems to rectify, and of course motorcycles in this case. This has been really interesting. I've really enjoyed working on this little Suzuki. It's quite a new machine actually, and other than a little bit of corrosion down below, it's not in bad nick. Anyway, there will obviously be a part two to this. Let's take a little look at the list and see what we've managed to achieve today and what I still have to do next weekend because it has to be finished next weekend. Right, hopefully, can you see that? I don't know. Burnt bit of cardboard. There we are, look, that'll do. Jeez. Okay, so where are we? Well, we've done the battery. We've fixed the charging fault. That's good. We've fixed the broken rear spokes. Well done, Andy. And of course, it's got a new tire, new rear tire, new tube, and we've done the chain and sprockets. We still have front brake pads to do, uh, pull rod missing. Oh, well, we sort of, we've sort of fixed that. I'm going to put a question mark there because I'm not happy the way it's, that I have managed, well, what I've had to do to make it work. Something is definitely not right. Uh, ignition we fixed, steering head bearings we've still got to do. So that's, we've got those to do, haven't we? Let's just put a box around there. And we've still got steering head bearings to do, which is quite a big job actually. It's all front forks out and everything, fuel tank off and things. Tail light, rear light indicators, we just don't know what we're going to do with that. Big question right there. And of course, it needs a service. It's desperate for an oil filter. And, uh, you know, what, oh, air filter as well. Oh, geez, I'm going to write that down actually. Air filter, because that's in a terrible state. I might try and pick up a new one of those. Okay, well, still a fair bit of work to do, but saying that, we've done, we've actually got a lot done today. It's been great. Thoroughly enjoyed it. So, we have done lots. We've replaced a uh, dodgy old ignition barrel, which I will, I've stole, even, even stole the wires off it because I needed that, uh, that bit of, um, you know, conduit stuff. So, we will do a video on that, work out what's wrong with the internals. Uh, we've changed the rear sprocket because look at the teeth on that that is fantastic that that's what we call like a sawtooth kind of effect yeah, good old farmers they, they definitely know how to get their money's worth don't they there's no doubt about that and oh we changed some spokes as well they're going to go in the bin and of course we diagnosed a fault with a reg rectifier and i showed you how to also test the output of a stator as well for the charging system that's it if you enjoyed the video why not click on the subscribe button is it on this side I think it's on this side, isn't it? Click on the subscribe button. You'll see a little gear icon turn up. Click on the gear, gear icon, and then you can tick the box, turn on notifications. And our friends at YouTube, they're going to send you an email as and when I upload any new videos. You'll also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Feel free to communicate through any of those portals, chaps and chapettes. Uh, there's also my email address down there in the comments. There's a Patreon page uh, for the Andy Mechanic YouTube channel. You can go onto there, and, and there's, a, there's a link on the home page. Go onto that. You can read all about the history of the channel, how it came to be, who I am, where I came from, why I do this, which is a bit odd. Not many people do YouTube channels. And, um, and profiles of all the tool girls. If you're interested in the tool girls, there's profiles down there and pictures and all sorts of stuff you can download. That is just one part of the channel, though. And there's a new PayPal icon on the homepage on YouTube. 
uh, for the Andy Mechanic channel and you can click on that and you can use that to purchase a 2020 Tool Girl calendar there's still a few left not many and uh, you can also donate through that as well as well as Patreon easy lots of different options okay crew I've got a workshop to tidy up I've got loads of bikes to bring inside I've got an ROV and some bikes on the trailers to strap on I could do with a shower and I'm getting really really hungry as always Okay, it's been a pleasure. Thoroughly enjoyed doing today's video for you, and my apologies if it's really, really long. Probably is. See you guys. Cheers. I'll run out. And we get the up again. Oh. Ha <laughs> ha